Well, Heavenly Father, we're so grateful and we're so thankful to be here once again um, during the holiday season, Father, um, as we are preparing to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, Lord, I pray that as we take this time to open up the Word of God, uh, that we will, you will, by the power of your Spirit, open up our eyes to behold wondrous things in your law and open up our minds that we'll understand the scriptures. I pray that your Holy Spirit will burn within us as you lead us along the road. Uh, Lord, it, is amazing, it has amazed me over these past few weeks um, how watching and observing the life of David, Father, has been so um, foundational as to how you have worked through his life in order to bring about your will and purposes, not only for Israel, but ultimately for the world. Um, Father, I pray that as we take this time to observe David's life, Lord, that you'll allow us to see um, David's understanding of submission and obedience to, to you, uh, despite his own sin nature and his failures. Um, he, he's not the perfect person, um, and that's the reason why we see him in this book, to know that um, you use imperfect people to accomplish your perfect will. And so we thank you, Lord, that you allow us in your sovereignty to participate in such a way uh, that brings you glory and allows us to see our need and dependency upon you. So, Lord, I pray that this study over the duration of our time has been able to point us to Jesus. Help us to see what he has accomplished through the death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. So, Lord, I now ask, Lord, that you will speak through our hearts. Lord, that what we know not will you teach us, what we have not will you give us, and who we are not will you make us. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So again, tonight we're coming to the last chapter in Samuel. This has been an amazing journey. I hope that you've been growing in, in your study of this book as I have. And, and as we've been able really to observe the life of David and all of its complexities from his rise to the throne as king over Israel, even to his misdeeds and failures as king, as king what becomes really profound in studying David's life is that the writer in 2 Samuel does not seem to try to hide or um, seek to pass over David's shortcomings in his life. The reality is there's no omission of David's life or his need or this need really to maintain this false facade of who David was during his time and reign as king. As a matter of fact, it's going to be that we see that God in his sovereign providence allows us to see David bare, naked in front of all the world to see. His faults, his failures, his rise and his fall. This is the man, the text lets us know, that is both a man after God's own heart, but at the same time, this is a man that struggled with his sin and sin nature from time to time. And hopefully this study has been encouraging for you as it's been for me in my life to help us realize that our journey with the Lord Jesus is not going to be a straight line. It's not a straight shot. It's going to be ups and downs, tops and turvies, failures and triumphs in life. And tonight it's really, friends, going to be no different um, as we see that the Holy Spirit is really leading us at this point to see the conclusion of 2 Samuel chapter 24, that it's going to be through David's life that we're going to see how God has used a mighty man, an imperfect man, might I add, to do mighty and victorious things for him. So if I were to outline our time through the text, we're going to see a few things. The first thing we're going to see is David's sin. David's sin, verses 1 through 9. We're then going to see judgment demanded, judgment demanded. That's verses 10 through 14. Then we're going to see pestilence sent, pestilence sent, verses 15 through 17. And then lastly, fellowship restored. I feel this is going to be a beautiful piece that we're going to see at the end. Fellowship restored, verses 18 through 25. And if I were to put a tag on our text tonight, it would simply be this. David's sin, sin, judgment, and restoration. David's sin, sin, judgment, and restoration. So with that being said, I invite you to meet me in 2 Samuel chapter 24. We're going to begin at verse 1 in our time tonight. 
And this is the reading of the word of the Lord. It says, Now again, the anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and it incited David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. Go, number Israel and Judah. The text, friends, begins rather interestingly in the sense that we're thrusted into this final chapter with the wording, now again, now again, regarding the anger of the, anger of the Lord burning against Israel. Now, the question that you and I should be thinking at this point on the onset of chapter 24 is what's happened? What's happened here? What, what has caused the anger of the Lord to burn against Israel yet again in this way. And again, as I've mentioned in previous teachings in 2 Samuel, whenever we see the Lord is angered with Israel or the Lord's anger burning against Israel, it is more times often always due to Israel's sin. And in this case, it's no different. Either the nation has sinned against God dealing with Torah law or it has been that Israel's leadership, meaning its king, has done something to offend God, breaking the law, um, and therefore causing Israel to take the brunt of the burden of the weight of sin. And so again, we're going to see later on tonight what that sin is. We're going to see what that sin is. Now, there's another question that comes up at this point, and that is, when was the anger of the Lord kindled against Israel before? Contextually speaking, again, it begins with saying now again. So we want to know before this point, when had this anger occurred? When it occurred? Well, we don't have to go too far in 2 Samuel to see that it's in 2 Samuel chapter 21, where a famine had swept through the land during David's reign. And it wasn't due to David's sin. It was actually due to Saul's sin. If you remember, Saul had broken an oath, and that oath was with Joshua in Joshua chapter 9. And in that, both Israel and Saul's descendants suffered greatly due to this breaking of the oath that Saul did. Okay, this breaking of the oath. And it would seem now at, at this point in 2 Samuel 24 that the tables in some way, shape, or form have now turned. That where Saul had sinned against God and had done wrong and broken an oath, now it seems that in David's reign as king, that now Israel is up against an issue here. That they're in a bit of a pickle. And now that cause is going to be because of something that David, as we see later on, has done. Again, the text mentions that the anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Do you see that in your text? That word for anger in Hebrew, is, it really means nose. It means nose. So the translation here would read, God's nose is burning. And this is a Hebrew idiom that's being used here. And, and knowing that God does not have human emotions like you and I have, what's simply being described here is that an injustice has taken place. And now justice has to be served. And if I were to take up time to say this, we should thank God that he does not have human emotions like you and I do. I thank God that he doesn't. God doesn't have a petty spirit in him as it relates to how he deals with his creation. Now, again, the text provides us no information regarding how Israel sinned or how they have offended Yahweh. We simply are shown that injustice has happened. And now justice has to be served. Why? Because we're dealing with the nature and character of God. That God is holy. And if anything goes against God's holiness as it pertains to what he is holding, it has to be corrected. And in this case, that is what's taken place. So at this point, again, another question is now beginning to arise. And we got a lot of questions that we have to ask here. And that question that arises now is, what would be the method in which the Lord is going to use to get Israel to recognize that they are now out of alignment with God and have committed sin against God? We don't have to go too far to see in part B of verse 1 what that is. 
It says that because of Israel's sin, the text lets us know that the Lord did something. He incited David. Do you see that? The Lord incited David against them to do a census. He's going to go and he's going to number Israel. He's going to go and he's going to number Judah. Now, this word incited is in Hebrew. It means to mislead. It means to allure away from either in a positive sense or in a negative sense. Now, again, on the onset, when you hear that God is inciting David to do something and you hear the definition of what incited means, you're probably thinking in your mind, this is out of character of who God is. God can't incite. He, he, he can't do those type of things. It goes against his nature, his righteousness. And I would agree with you and say you're absolutely correct. Because when you look at James chapter 1, verse 13, it speaks to the fact that God does not tempt, nor does God cause anyone to sin. Rather, what God does is he tests in order to prove his work and his word through us. So I wanted to go really quickly to James chapter 1, verse 13. Because I want us to see what James is saying in regards to God's nature as it pertains to this testing. Again, James chapter 1, verse 13. This is what it reads. Let no one say when he is tempted, I have been tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt anyone. Anyone. So the question becomes... If God is consistent in his nature and in his character, then how is God the insider to cause David's sin? How is he the instigator in this sense? Well, when you read through the parallel passage of 2 Samuel chapter 24, it's, it's found in 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1, you're going to see two things. And I want you to go ahead and meet me really quickly at 1 Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1. And these are the two things that you're going to see in this parallel passage. The first thing that you're going to see is we're going to find out who is the instrument used to cause David to sin. Who is the instrument used to cause David to sin? Secondly, we're going to see what is the sin that David committed, but a result of the sin of the nation. Okay, I'm going to say that part again. What is the sin that, they, that is committed by David, which results in the sin of the nation? Those are the two things we're going to see in the parallel passage found in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1. So I'm going to read it into your hearing, verses 1 and 2. This is what it reads. Then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the princes of the people, go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring me word that I may know their number. Do you see that? It says then who? Satan. So here we see that the cause of David to number the people is not God, but rather Satan who is inciting David. Now, some can look at these two accounts and say, how are these two accounts able to be reconciled? How are you able to look and see that in 2 Samuel 24, it says that God incited, but in 1 Chronicles 21, it now says that Satan incited. Friends, what we see here is that the Lord in his sovereignty is allowing Satan to influence David's motivation to take a census of the people. In other words, God uses the enemy to bring about divine judgment on the object of his anger. Who is the object of God's anger in this section? It's David. We're going to see why later. And what we find here is a familiar concept. It's a familiar concept of how the Lord allows evil influences in this life to accomplish his purposes and plans for his glory. Often it's through the frailties of human condition and our giving in to our own sin nature that the Lord reveals our sinful conditions in that we might turn and repent and go to him. Plainly put, these divine detours 
are meant for us to see the arrogance of our own ways so that we may turn to the Lord. If you don't believe me, we find um, iterations of this in the first book that's written, the book of Job, as well as 1 Kings chapter 22. I would encourage you to read 1 Kings chapter 22 in your own time because you're going to see that it's there where the Lord is going to use what seems to be this sense of misdirection as a divine device or instrument to reveal truth. Very interesting. And in both instances, God allows or he permits this means of inciting, this tempting and, and, and testing to hold the individual responsible for their behavior. And we find in verses two through four now what the sin of Israel truly was. And you're going to find as we read through verses two through four that it's quite ironic how it comes about. So pick me back up at 2 Samuel chapter 24, and we're going to read verses 2 through 4. This is what it says. The king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go about now through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba and register the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, Now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to register the people of Israel. So it's in verses two through four that we see David's command to Joab is to do what? It's to initiate a census for the people of Israel. That's what the text tells us. However, if we closely examine the parallel passage in 1 Chronicles 21, verses 3 through 5, we find that the census did not include all of Israel. It didn't include all of Israel. Instead, the census consisted of only, check this out, the men of Israel. It excluded women and children. Well, friends, what this shows us is that it was not a sin to take a census of the people. The, the census is not the issue here. As a matter of fact, the practice of taking a census of the nation was given by God to Moses in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, as well as Numbers chapter 1 and Numbers chapter 26. So what does this mean? This means that something preceded this moment which causes this heart check test for David to commence. In other words, God in his sovereignty, if we were to think about it in this way, God in his sovereignty, because he cannot tempt, he is testing the heart of David. But the way in which the enemy is using this is he's trying to tempt David to see and let God know, hey, he's a sinner. So you have two things happening at the same time. But ultimately, what you see in the grand scheme is God's sovereignty at work, allowing this to take place so David can see something in himself. Does that make sense? Let's keep moving here. I want us to really quickly see what's happening regarding this census. Check out with me 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 3 through 5, because it's going to be in the parallel passage that we're going to see what the root of the sin of this census was about. Again, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 3 through 5. It reads this way. Job said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why does my Lord seek this thing? I want you to underline this last part of verse three. Why should he be a cause of guilt to Israel? Underline that there. Here's verse four. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Job. Therefore, Job departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Job gave the number of the census of all the people to David and all Israel were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. I would underline that. And Judah was 470,000 men who drew the sword. I would underline that. 
So we find that the root behind God's anger against Israel was David's arrogance and David's pride. And as a result, the nation now becomes a casualty. Friends, what's happening here? The nation at this particular point in David's rule and reign as king is that they've come to a point of immense blessing and prosperity as a nation. They, they, they got to a point where they really had no need or want for anything because all was provided. And here's the reality, that when you find yourself in a place of great blessing and growth, it's our human nature to see the blessing and forget the blessor. That I see what God has done, but then I forget what it is that he did. Because now I'm thinking, oh, it's me. I did it. It's often the case that our mountaintop experiences allow us to see the goodness of God. And it's that our, in our valley experiences in our life, our low moments in life, that we begin to see the mercy of God, the goodness of God. Again, if you recall, within the life of David, he was able to speak mightily of the wonders and provision of God. Why? Because he had endured through much with God. So what caused this pride to swell within the heart of David was seeing the nation's prosperity and blessing within the land. Notice in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 5, David's census includes men who drew the sword. In other words, this is a military census to show the might of the nation. Friends, the reality was David looked at the numbers of his army instead of depending upon the God behind the army. Every time they would go out to battle, victory was attained, not because of the numbers, simply because of the fact that it was the, God, the warrior God, the warrior king, Yahweh, behind them fighting on their behalf. And the reality is we oftentimes do the same thing in our own lives, don't we? We get beside ourselves and, and, and think that our degrees or our accolades or our skill sets have somehow gotten us to where we are, rather than recognizing that it is God and God alone who has sustained us, provided for us, and has made a way for us. However, we, we, when we boil everything down, when we look at it at its core, it is the Lord that has provided. The Lord had made a way for David. David, as a matter of fact, a, few, a, a chapter or so ago, recognizes that it's not his blamelessness, nor is it his righteousness, but it's God's righteousness. Yet now David is sitting and he's looking at his kingdom. He's looking at what he's acquired. He's looking at the victories that he's won. He's looking at the prosperity and the blessing of the nation. He's looking at the economic growth of the nation. And now he's looking at the military that he has attained. He said, I got it all. I'm good. We did this. And God is looking at it and saying, no, David, you missed it. You didn't do anything. I did all of this. The friends, this is what Proverbs chapter 18, verses 10 through 12 says regarding matters of pride within the human heart. Check this out. Proverbs chapter 18, verses 10 through 12. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and is safe. A rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own imagination. Before destruction, the heart of man is haughty, but humility goes before honor. So rather than David resting and depending upon the faithful provision of the Lord, he saw what they had seemingly achieved and he credited it credited it to himself. And interestingly, interestingly enough, it was Job who notices something's off with the king. Did you notice that? It, it's, it's interesting to me that it's Job that points this fact out that, hey, no, the king is going to be able to bring about the victory that we need. The king, if, if we needed more people, the king would add to this body in order for us to be victorious. In other words, friends, Job realized that our strength lies in the Lord 
And that David, if you ask the Lord to add to this body because of war that's coming about, the Lord will provide for us. I found it quite comical that Joab, the hot-headed, violent, and quick-witted guy, responds to David in such wisdom. Yet this wisdom from an unwise man was not heard because the king's word tells us it prevailed. It prevailed. Friends, if, if there's anything that we see thematically happening in the text, we see God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty is always at work irregardless of human decision. Whether you're making the right decision or the wrong decision, it all funnels through his sovereign work and plan. Check out really quickly verses 5 through 9. Verses 5 through 9. So again, David said for Joab and them to go and to do uh, the census. We pick up here verse 5. They crossed the Jordan and camped in Ararer on the right side of the city that is in the middle of the valley of Gad and toward Jazir. Then they came to Gilead and to the land of Tatim Hachi, and they came to Dan John and around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and of the Canaanites, and they went out to the south of Judah to Beersheba. So when they had gone about through the whole land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and 20 days. Here's verse 9. And Joab gave the number of the registration of the people to the king. And there were in Israel 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword. And the men of Judah were 500,000 men. So it's upon the king's request now that Joab and his men traveled in this counterclockwise fashion throughout the land, covering all their bases. And I want to show us a map here really quickly, this, the progression that they take counterclockwise. If you notice on the left side, this is where Jerusalem is centered. I had to break up the map because it was uh, very long. Um, on the right side, you're going to see northern Israel. And if you notice the progression, one, two, three, four picks up off of Geshir there, five, six, and seven. That's the pathway in which they're taking around. And this map of their travels totaled to close to about 285 days in and around there. And it ends in and around the springtime, 285 days. And being that within the Jewish year, there are 355 days, it means that there was now 70 days left within the year. So this process of doing this census was no small feat. This took time for Job and the commanders to go around and to get the number of men throughout all the land. Furthermore, regardless of the varying count, because you will notice within 2 Samuel 24, as well as 1 Chronicles 21, that there's going to be a difference in number. I want you to understand, don't be um, surprised or like, oh my gosh, what's happening there with the text? Understand that what's happening there is it's simply at this point a copyist error. That's what's happening in the text. As a matter of fact, in 2 Samuel, you're going to find a lot of copyist errors as it, as it pertains to transcription. However, it does not take away from the inerrancy of Scripture. What do I mean by that? That you can look at these numbers, and although they are varied regarding its numerical value, that's not the point. The point is, the, the, the focus is how David responds to the census. That's what we need to look at and see in the text. So really quickly, go with me to verses 10 through 14, because it's going to be in these four verses that we're going to see how David responds once he receives word after 285 days of the census having taken place. Beginning, here it is at verse 10. Now David's heart troubled him. There it is. His heart troubled him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant. For I have acted very foolishly. When David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David. Thus the Lord says, I am offering you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, 
which I will do to you. Verse 13. So Gad came to David and told him and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and see what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And again, as a quick note, if you're reading a translation of the Bible other than NASB, you may find, for example, in the ESV that that number seven for seven years may actually be three. We're going to get to that in a little bit, so stick with me on that. Here's verse 14. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So it's after having received the numbers from this census that David, the text tells us, became troubled in his heart. This is huge. He became troubled in his heart. And in David having become troubled in his heart, he confesses to the Lord that he has sinned greatly against him. As a matter of fact, this word that David uses here for greatly is me'od in Hebrew. And this word has never been used by David regarding his sin. Me'od has never been used as it relates to David in regards to his sin. In other words, David saw that he had done grievously wrong against the Lord. Why? Because of his pride and his arrogance. He had done grievously wrong against the Lord. Friends, it's, it's one thing to sin, but it's another thing to sin and not realize what you've done against the holy God. And here it is. David's quite aware of what he's done. He's not surprised. He's not a taken back. He's not trying to hide himself. No, when he realized what he did against holy God, he confesses. He makes it known. From there, David immediately turns to the Lord for forgiveness of his sins. And friends, if I can just say this for a moment, what a beautiful thing it is to know that the Lord is waiting to forgive those who turn to him. We oftentimes have in our minds this big, angry, scary, mad God, and he doesn't want to be ready to forgive the believer. Friends, this is far from the truth. Here it is. David's life is an example showing us that when it comes down to our sin, God is not sitting here angry looking at you saying, well, you, you better get it together. What he's doing is he's waiting for you to respond. Do you see what you've done? Is your heart broken? Because a broken and contrite heart, the Lord is able to deal with. And when you realize it, you turn to him in confessing your sin. Friend, this is a perfect demonstration of seeing the heart of David. This is why the Bible tells us David was a man after God's own heart. The point is not for us, understand, the point is not for us to try to be like David. Please don't do that. The point is for us to see that David's life, in his life, within his own sin nature, what does David do time and time again? He runs to the Lord. He repents. He runs to the Lord. I've sinned greatly against you, Lord. Forgive me. That should be the pattern of even our lives. That in the Lord, we know that there is forgiveness of sins. For instance, First John chapter 1, verse 9 tells us this. If we confess our sins... He might be faithful to? No, it says he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. It's not a maybe, it's a for sure thing. Believer, God's forgiveness is fully available in Christ who is ready and faithful to forgive you and I and to cleanse us of our sins. As a matter of fact, he's sitting right now at the right hand of the Father in his session advocating and praying on your and I behalf right now. He's able to, to forgive, friends. But understand that there must be a willingness to be open and transparent before a holy God. I hope we see that there. In other words, we have to not fall into the trap that Adam fell into in the garden. 
that where Adam, after he and Eve sinned, tried to put on fig leaves, we have to throw away the fig leaves. Why? Because God already knows. He's simply waiting for you and I to respond to what it is that we've done. So, upon David's recognition of his sin and confession of his sin, we see that the Lord immediately, immediately, and graciously responds through David's prophet, the prophet Gad. It began by saying the Lord was angered against Israel, yet now, notice the text recognizes that it was David's sin that has caused Israel to be greatly judged. Do you see the, the change that took place there? It begins by saying that the, the anger of the Lord was against who? Israel. And now it's showing that David is actually confessing that it's his doing that has caused the nation to be in this blight. And really, as a quick note, we must not miss this point that as goes the king, so goes the nation. That was Job's point earlier on. In other words, the leadership over the people will either lead them into blessing or it will lead them into demise. Who's your leadership? And in this case, David's pride has now caused an entire nation to face judgment. So in God's merciful response, he provides David with three choices. Three choices of punishment. David is given the opportunity to choose whatever of the three options presented. And the fact that the Lord provides choices for David is a mercy in and of itself. Yet it is not without consequence. Meaning, in other words, God's justice must always be satisfied according to his righteousness. As my professor, uh, Dr. Charlie Clough said, you can have the opportunity to sin how you want to sin, when you want to sin, and how you want to do the sin, but you don't have the opportunity to choose your consequence. You're going to have to deal with it one way or the other. And really quickly, as a side note, although David is given choices, friends, understand that this is prescriptive, not descriptive. This is, I'm sorry, excuse me, I said that backwards. This is not prescriptive. This is descriptive. What do I mean by that? Prescriptive means that this is how it works as it pertains to the faith. This is how the, the framework works for forgiveness, or how the framework works for consequence. Whereas descriptive is simply describing what's happening. What is happening to a particular person? What's happened to David? What's happened to Saul? What's happened to Samuel? So this example is simply descriptive as to how God dealt with David. So again, when you and I sin, don't look for there to be opportunity of um, what your consequence is. I'm going to give you this option, option A or B. Which option do you want, Wesley? No. Whatever I choose in my own sin nature, whatever the result is going to be is what the result is going to be. So, in the very next morning, we find that David receives a response from the Lord. He receives the response from the Lord, from the prophet Gad. And Gad, again, he presents three choices. The first choice is that there would be, in, according to the NASB, it says a seven-year famine in the land. And as I mentioned earlier, depending upon what translation you're looking at, it's going, it will read three years. More specifically, in the ESV, it'll say three years. And that is due to a copyist error. Translation, as it pertains from the Masoretic text to uh, a Septuagint translation or from a particular translation of ESV, CSB, so on and so forth. The second option that David is given is that David would flee three months from his enemies as they pursued him. Okay? And then the last one would be three days of pestilence in the land. So if you look at it in the ESV, 333 is happening as it relates to the consequences that are going to occur. Now, regardless of all the choices, was the reality an impending doom of destruction, death, and disruption? Notice there was no consequence that said, oh, I'm not going to punish you for not following and being prideful and arrogant. No, each one is equally severe. It just depends upon the duration 
right? How long is this judgment going to last as it pertains to the consequence of one's sin? So again, if I were to break it down, the first option would last, again, if we're looking at the ESV, three years. The second option would last three months. And the last option would last three days. Now, just out of there, which one would you pick? Okay. <laughs> and in David's consideration, he relies, check this out, David relies on the mercy of God amidst his distress. I, I, I love what uh, the ESV says here at verse 14. It says, I'm in distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercy is what? Great. His mercy is great. For, for if there was one thing that David knew, friends, about God, despite David's misdeeds, it was that God was, in fact, merciful. He has seen God at work time and time again. And I find this quite informative. Why? Because it shows us David's shift in his disposition. That at one point, David, did, he didn't listen to Joab's um, insight as it pertained to doing the census. He, he, he's focusing on himself and he's looking at what he sees. But now there seems to be a change of mindset for David. He's recognized what he's done. He's recognized how he sinned against God. And now David turns and he says, oh, but he's merciful. And what does he do? He immediately says, however the Lord wills it, may it be. The only thing that David says at the end, he says, but let me not fall into the hands of man. In other words, man's consequence for me would be far worse. But God, as it pertains to those in whom he loves, is quite merciful. David comes to the reality of knowing, I know who my provider is. I know what God's promises are. Furthermore, David, regarding his choice of consequence, uh, later rabbis actually argued his rationale. Because if you notice that it begins by saying that David is given options of choosing. And then it makes this notion that David has somehow made a decision or that God has made the decision for David in that sense. And so rabbis in their arguing what's happening here, they, they said this. This is what they deduced. And I quote, if I, meaning David, chose famine, the people will say that I chose something which will affect them and not me, for I shall be well supplied with food. If I chose war, they, um, they will say that the king is well protected. Let me choose pestilence before which all are equal. So that's the rabbi's reasoning as to why David chose that option. In other words, David knew that no one could be excluded from his judgment, including himself. That my wealth and my riches aren't going to keep me from the judgment I know I have to face. Yet at the same time, David knew that the Lord would not cause those who are his to suffer forever. Why? Because his grace is sufficient. Check out what Micah says in Micah chapter 7, verse 8. He states it this way. I love it. He says, who is a God like you who pardons iniquity and passes over the rebellious act of the remnant of his possession? He does not retain his anger forever. Why? Because he delights in unchanging love. Friends, it's like the parent who disciplines their child when the child has done wrong and although the punishment is necessary and at times painful, it's but a for time. It doesn't happen forever. And growing up, I never understood why my parents would tell me, Wesley, this whooping is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. I never understood that. I thought it was the worst thing ever. But now as a parent, I understand what my parents meant by that statement. In other words, what they meant was the punishment is great because of my love for you. And because I love you, the duration of the punishment won't last forever. It's only going to be for a moment. Why? Because I want you to see something. That, that's, that's the purpose. I want you to see something. It's not to hurt you or harm you. It's to direct you and to teach you. So David and Israel 
are now going to experience the judgment in which is being brought upon them. Check out verses 15 through 17. It says, so the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And 70,000 men of the people from Dan to Beersheba died. When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who destroyed the people, it is enough. Now relax your hand. The angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Arunua, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking down the people and said, Behold, it is I who have sinned, and it is I who have done wrong. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. Powerful statements here. The judgment of the Lord is now being fully realized by David as the text mentions that 70 thousand people died from Dan to Beersheba in three days. In three days. That where David's desire to see the number of his kingdom increase due to his pride, it now has resulted in the loss of thousands. For this, this had to have been a sobering reality for David to look upon and see this. And herein lies a peak behind the veil as it relates to the effects of sin. That what we think is private enjoyment ends up being the demise of ourselves and the impacts of those that are around us. I, I tell my son, I tell my kids all the time, your sin nature just doesn't impact you, but it impacts those who are around you. Sin at its very core, if you were to break down what sin is, sin at the end of the day is the exchange of the worship of God for yourself. Missing the mark in some way, shape, or form because you think you're better than God. That's what happens. Verse 16 mentions that it was the angel of the Lord who stretched out his hand and is now causing this calamity all throughout the land. And the text lets us know that now this calamity is beginning to get to Jerusalem. It's getting to the city. However, the text makes an interesting pivot. Makes a pivot here because as the hand of the angel of the Lord is moving towards Jerusalem, because again, judgment is not going to be stopped. Justice has to be served. The text lets us know that God, Yahweh, tells him it's enough. Stop. Don't go any further. Clearly, the angel of the Lord had all intentions of destroying the very city of Jerusalem. That word destroy in Hebrew means to ruin to completely annihilate, obliterate. And the cease of this destruction was due to what the text says, the Lord relenting from the calamity headed towards Jerusalem. Whew, this, y'all, this got me. And I pray that you get it tonight. This, this word relent is an interesting word. If you're taking notes, I would write this down. This word relent shows up 108 times in 100 verses in the Old Testament. The origin of this root word for relent is neham, neham. And it carries this idea of someone breathing deeply. It's as if displaying compassion towards one who's done wrong. You ever, you ever when your son or daughter or, or friend does something that you're like, <sighs> that's what's happening here with relenting. That's, that's the word used here. Yet before, if you were to consider this, imagine um, a child or, or a relative is, is before a judge. And right before the judge brings about the verdict, the judge looks at you and he, that before he throws the book down, he considers some things. And before the gavel is torn down, he changes his mind. The Septuagint renders the word neham both as metanoeo 
and metamelomai, which is where we get the word repent from in the New Testament. Only repent in this context is not how human beings repent, but how God changes his mind. Understand God does not repent as it relates to how human beings repent. In other words, human beings repent due to our sin. God cannot sin. So when this term is used of God, friends, it is actually anthropopathic. That word is this big theological word. Anthropopathic simply means it's ascribing human feelings to someone who's not human. So God is not changing his mind as it relates to his decree, his sovereign decree or his word. Rather, he's changing how he carries out his judgment according to man's change in conduct. As one Jewish theologian notates, he says this in his book, The Prophets, a change in man's conduct brings about a change in God's judgment. Now, you might be asking, well, Wesley, where do we see this in Scripture? Well, we, friends, we see this displayed in God's mercy, exhibited towards those who respond positively, positively to his word and his promises. You see it in Habakkuk, where there's a particular area in Habakkuk where it says that there's this sign that people are running to, and the sign is this warning, turn to the Lord, turn to the Lord. And the point of seeing that is human being make a choice that is going to allow you to have blessing and not demise. You see this in a few places. If you stick around with us a little bit afterwards, we'll go through a few of them. But you see this in 1 Chronicles 21 verse 15. You see this in Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 8. You see this in Jeremiah chapter 26 verse 3. Amos chapter 7, verse 3, Amos chapter 7, verse 6, and Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. This is where you see this change of mind happening. So this relenting of the calamity that would have rightfully taken out Jerusalem is ceased because David repented. And what becomes so beautiful towards the end of verse 17 is not only David's personal confession of his sin, but him taking on the responsibility of the sin instead of Israel. David, friends, desires to take on the punishment himself. Did you notice where David calls them sheep? He calls them sheep in the sense that he's responsible for their safety. He's responsible for the protection. Where else do you see David use these words of sheep? He, Psalm 23. So where David is the Mashiach for the nation of Israel, the Lord Jesus is Messiah, our shepherd, as well within the body of Christ. Friends, there's a sense here when David is saying the sheep, there's this sense of personal ownership of the calamity. And this desire now to take upon himself the due penalty of his sin. And what a picture that is. Because it shows us how Christ, who did not sin, yet graciously took upon himself our guilt and sin as if it were his own. We see that in New Testament. He who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. You see the parallel with David here. Lastly, there are two things worth noting in verses 16 and 17. And that is the angel of the Lord and where he stops his destruction. The text first mentions that the angel of the Lord, check this out, was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, when he ceased the destruction. And David is allowed to see this angel striking down the people. This had to be a terrifying sight to be able to see the very angel that's bringing about this calamity. And in the text, it's quite possible, friends, and I believe that this is true, that the angel of the Lord that is here regarding this calamity is none other than the pre-incarnate Christ himself, bringing about this devastation and this destruction. Now, let's note where the destruction is withdrawn. The text mentions that the mercy of the Lord is exhibited at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. 
Now, if you aren't familiar with what a threshing floor is, a threshing floor was a level outdoor plot of land that sits on the top of a hill or on top of a rock, and it's there where threshing happens. If you're familiar with the parable of the wheat and the tares, you know of the separation and the separating of the chaff from the wheat, it would be at these high mountain tops that the chaff would blow off. Right. So the, this threshing floor is dealing with the place of judgment where there needs to be um, judgment taken care of regarding the sins of one. And this location of the threshing floor was located north of the northern walls of David's Jerusalem, which meant that this property, this land was not owned by David, it was actually owned by a Jebusite. Furthermore, it's this location of the where the future temple mount would be for the future site of Solomon's temple. And I will show you a graphic of that later on. And what's even more interesting here is that it's not by coincidence that the very location of this threshing floor that this Jebusite owned, also being the future place of where Solomon would build his temple, but furthermore, this was the exact same place where Abraham was sent by God to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. This location would be Mount Moriah. And the image you see here is actually of the lower section of the yellow is the city of David. And there's a dash section where the arrow is pointing to where the threshing floor would be located, where the threshing floor would be located. So David repents again before Yahweh becomes uh, the, and this place where David is now going to is going to be the future place where he's going to be able to give his future sacrifice to the Lord to relent from this devastation. So check out with me our last few verses, verses 18 through 25. It says, so Gad came to David that day and said to him, go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arunah the Jebusite. David went up according to the word of Gad, just as the Lord had commanded. Aruna looked down and saw the king and his servants crossing over toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed his face to the ground before the king. Then Arunua said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be held back from the people. Aruna said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up what is good in his sight. Look, the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges, and the, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. Everything, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. However, the king said to Aruna, no, but I will surely buy it from you for peace. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Thus the Lord was moved by prayer for the land and the plague was held back from Israel. So it's on this last day. It's on this last day that the plague is now going to stop because David is going to be setting up this altar on the threshing floor. And without hesitation, in immediate obedience, David went up, meaning that he's ascending to this particular place. Because if you think about Jerusalem, there's elevation that's happening. So whenever you're leaving Jerusalem, you're always going down, geographically speaking. So David's ascending up to this particular point. And David is going up because he's about to purchase this land. And Arunua was the owner of this land. And he was a Jebusite. A Jebusite was simply a non-Israelite. So he is not an Israelite in this regard. And so Aruna sees the king coming towards him and Arunua bends the knee. And this is simply signifying honor to the king. And it's in this moment that Arunua asked the king, what brings you this way? What, what brings you this way? And David responds and he tells Arunua he's looking to buy land in order to keep the plague from coming about. And what does Arunua do? He immediately seeks to try to provide the king whatever he needs. Land, he even throws oxen, stone, and wood in order for David to build this altar. Now, it's interesting because towards this particular piece here, Arunua must have known David was out of fellowship with the Lord. I say that because he uses a particular word 
in verse 23. He uses this word for accept. It, it is ratsa, ratsa. And that word accept here means to take pleasure in or to accept favorably. And the idea of accept here is dealing with propitiation. Propitiation. That to be right with God requires one to approach God in an acceptable manner. And clearly, Aranua understood the significance of sacrifices, and therefore he's providing David with the oxen and all that the king would need. You see, the purpose of the burnt offering, friends, was for atonement, whereas the purpose of the peace offering was that of fellowship. And here's the good news for you and I, that your and I sin do not remove us positionally from the Lord. Meaning when you fall short of the glory of God, you don't lose your salvation. You are eternally kept. I thank God for that reality. Rather, when we sin, what does happen is we get out of fellowship with God. And fellowship has to be brought back again. And the way to restore broken fellowship is through what we saw in 1 John, confessing of sin. That's why we always start every teaching off with silent prayer, that you and I can confess our sins to the Lord to be in right fellowship with him so that we can hear the word of God clearly and respond accordingly. Therefore, friends, it's in Christ that the full satisfaction of the Father's wrath has been accomplished through the crushing of his son. This is why you and I can approach the Lord correctly. Not because of your righteousness or my righteousness, solely because of Christ's righteousness. Well, after hearing of Aruna's proposition to the king, David doesn't accept it. He doesn't accept the proposition for free. He says, no, I'm going to pay a price. The reason why he says that, he says, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord, check this out, which costs me nothing. In other words, it's not a sacrifice to the Lord if, it's, if there's no cost that is counted. Here, here's a food for thought. When was the last time that a fast to the Lord that you've done to consider was something that didn't cost you something great? Is a fast really a fast if it's something that's easy for you? No. When has anything of great value been worth attaining to if it wasn't worth working for? That's what David is getting to here. So we see this value bring about. He pays Aruna 50 shekels of silver, and that dollar amount today is about $1,067. Now, if you read Chronicles' account, Chronicles' account is going to say about 600, um, I believe, gold, if you will, 600 shekels of gold. And that amount in U.S. dollars today is in and around half a million dollars. So David put some money down towards this area. And he's doing it in order to not only cause the plague to bypass, but to be in right fellowship with the Lord. You see, David's recognition of his sin and submitting himself to the Lord position now both Israel and David to be in right fellowship with the Lord. And though David's repentance response to the Lord and, and through David, excuse me, his repentance, the Lord responded accordingly. If you ever get time, and I know we're coming up to time here, whenever you get time to read Deuteronomy, I want you to notice the section of Deuteron Deuteronomy where you get to blessing and curses. That's huge. Because the history of Samuel and the kings is all connected to what's taking place in Deuteronomy regarding the law. It's always happening. And here's the beautiful thing here. How kind is it of the Lord to bring Abraham to the same place to offer up his son Isaac and now for David, having sinned against God, to now bring and buy the land in which although he won't be able to build the temple for the Lord, but his son will, he's now provided the place and the space for that to be done. Yet we also are going to see later on, you see later on in the Gospels, that the same place is going to be a reminder, the Temple Mount is going to be a reminder that sacrifice is required to be made right with God. 
that there, you cannot be made right with God where there is no right sacrifice. And it's going to be this very same place where the Lord Jesus Christ is going to have to go in order to do what? Atone for the sins of the world. Isn't it interesting that in Mark's gospel, Mark 15, that it's where the veil tears at the temple mount. All of this, friends, in order to reconcile man with God. And here it is that God uses David to buy this plot of land so that this could be accomplished. Friends, my prayers wrap up here. My friend, my prayer is that David's life will be a reminder for us to see and to understand that obedience and dependency upon the Lord is essential. That it's not based upon your righteousness or my righteousness, it's based upon his righteousness. May David's life be a constant reminder even all the more of who we are in Christ. That positionally, you and I are justified in Christ. Relationally, we are sanctified in Christ. And experientially, we are matured and glorified in Christ. David's life encourages all of us. It's this picture, really, of encouragement to all of us that our lives are not perfect. David's life, for sure, was not perfect, but yet he served God as best as he could. And that's the hope that we have today, that you serve the Lord as best as you can in obedience and submission to him as best as you can. And even when you fall short, he's faithful to forgive. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know we went over time, but Lord, I pray that you will speak to the hearts of these men and women to understand that you are faithful to forgive, that your grace is sufficient, and your mercies are great. We thank you for your love and your kindness. We ask that you bring uh, about just so much transformation in the hearts and lives of these men and women. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.